In the heart of southwest England, nestled in the coastal beauty of Plymouth, my weekends were marked by long runs, a ritual to keep my fitness in check. Last June, I decided to venture into the unfamiliar terrain of Bulberry Down, weaving through the cliffs and forests of Beck's Gardens. I had heard tales of its breathtaking beauty, the invigorating sea air that accompanied every step. As I approached the tenth kilometer mark, a dense fog began to descend upon my thoughts. Lost and disoriented, I missed a crucial turn, unknowingly straying off course. Soon, I found myself on the outskirts of a small village called Sulcum, its charm beckoning me to explore. The clock neared 4.30, and the relentless summer heat showed no signs of waning. Hoping to quench my thirst, I decided to venture into Sulcum for a quick pit stop. Little did I know, this detour would lead me to an unexpected encounter that would forever alter my perception of the quaint village. As I approached the village, a pressing need to relieve myself struck. A secluded wooded area appeared to be the perfect spot to answer nature's call. With a cautious glance around to ensure my solitude, I ventured off the road, seeking refuge behind a tree. Little did I know, this momentary pause would unravel a series of events that would haunt my memories for months to come. After my brief respite, I resumed my journey towards the village. But as I approached the roadside, my eyes caught sight of something ominous lying in the dirt, shrouded in bin bags. A morbid thought crossed my mind, had I stumbled upon the dumping ground of a local serial killer? Dismissing it as melodrama, I convinced myself it was more likely a case of fly-tipping gone awry. Approaching the mysterious heap, the first sight was oddly familiar, a perfectly sliced piece of meat. However, horror gripped me as I discerned the unmistakable stump of a person's neck atop their shoulders. They had been decapitated. The overpowering stench of death assaulted my senses, reminiscent of the ammonia-laden odor when chicken goes bad in the fridge. Gagging, I stumbled back onto the road, purging the water I had consumed earlier. In shock, I dialed the authorities, recounting the grisly discovery. The police instructed me to wait as they dispatched a forensic team to the scene. Strangely, their initial suspicion seemed to veer towards me as the potential culprit, the one who had callously dumped a lifeless body. It took some explaining, but eventually, they realized I was an unwitting witness to a heinous crime. As the forensics team cordoned off the wooded area with caution tape, I found myself in the company of a police officer who kindly offered me a ride back to my car, parked near Hope Cove. Fearful of a fine for public urination, I braced myself, but the police were more concerned with solving a murder than petty offenses. In the subsequent days, the police reached out again, inquiring about any suspicious activity I might have witnessed on the day of the discovery. Recounting my story, I assured them the area was deserted during my visit. The investigation into the murder of the victim, a Malaysian woman in her sixties, seemed to be ongoing, with no news of an arrest. The incident left me shaken, my trust in the safety of woodlands forever tainted. Clusters of trees now evoke thoughts of potential crime scenes, discarded like unwanted refuse. The realization that such atrocities occur in seemingly serene places lingered in my mind, a haunting reminder of the darkness that can hide in the most unexpected corners. Months passed, and the details of the crime unfolded slowly. The lack of news about the perpetrator's capture added to my lingering unease. The thought that someone capable of such brutality roamed free was enough to turn my stomach. I couldn't shake the feeling that justice remained elusive for the victim and her grieving loved ones. In sharing this story, my hope is that someone in the UK might come across the details and recognize the victim. Perhaps they hold a piece of information crucial to solving the case. The memory of that day weighs heavy on my conscience, and I believe the person responsible for such a heinous act deserves to be held accountable, ensuring they can no longer roam the streets freely. As I continue my runs, the picturesque landscapes that once brought solace now carry a shadow of somber reflection. 
The beauty of Bulberry Down and Sulcum is forever marred by the grim discovery, a stark reminder of the fragility of life and the darkness that can lurk beneath even the most idyllic surfaces. In June of last year, my routine weekend run through the cliffs and forests of Bulberry Down in Plymouth, southwest England, took a harrowing turn. Bulberry Down, known for its stunning scenery and invigorating sea air, had always been a favorite route of mine. However, on this particular run, when I reached the 10th kilometer mark, things took an unexpected and chilling twist. Lost in thought, the so-called brain fog began to descend as I inadvertently missed a crucial turn. The unfamiliar terrain led me to signs pointing to a small town called Sulcum. It was approaching 4.30 p.m., and the scorching heat intensified my sense of disorientation. Deciding to head into Sulcum to ask for directions back to my starting point in a place called Marlborough, I hoped to grab some water and continue my run. As I descended a hill into Sulcum, the urgency to relieve myself struck, an unfortunate consequence of long-distance running. Spotting a wooded area, I veered off the road, hoping to find a discreet spot behind a tree. Little did I know that this detour would lead me to a discovery that would haunt me for a long time. After a quick scan to ensure privacy, I ran up a grassy verge into the woods. Still lost and disoriented, my plan was to ask for directions and resume my run within the hour. However, what unfolded was a horrifying encounter that shook me to my core. As I finished my business and headed back toward the road, I noticed something lying in the dirt, wrapped in bin bags. Initially dismissing it as discarded rubbish, I approached for a closer look. The first glimpse suggested a mere cut of meat, but as I widened the bin liner with my running shoe, the gruesome reality became apparent, a decapitated human head atop a person's shoulders. The putrid smell of death overwhelmed me, triggering a visceral reaction. I recoiled, retching and stumbling back onto the road. Summoning the courage, I immediately called the police. The gravity of being the one to stumble upon a crime scene heightened as the police instructed me to wait for questioning. Fear gripped me when I realized they suspected me of foul play, but eventually, I cleared my name by recounting the bizarre circumstances of my discovery. Days later, the police reached out again, inquiring about any suspicious activity on the day of my run. Despite my assertion that the area appeared deserted when I relieved myself, they seemed determined to solve the mystery surrounding the victim, an elderly Malaysian woman in her sixties. The lack of news about the perpetrator's arrest suggested an ongoing investigation, leaving a lingering unease. The trauma of that day lingered, manifesting as apprehension during subsequent runs, especially near wooded areas. The thought of others meeting similar gruesome fates and being discarded like unwanted rubbish haunted my thoughts. I hoped that sharing this narrative might prompt someone in the UK to come forward with information, providing closure for the victim and justice against the perpetrator still at large. Years earlier, during my university days, I joined the Walking and Hiking Society. The seemingly mundane name belied the exhilarating adventures it offered, including annual trips to some of the world's best hiking spots. In my second year, the destination was the Carpathian Mountains, stretching across Central Europe, with the majority situated in Romania. While the Carpathians boasted wild forests and fearsome wildlife, it was the human encounter during our journey that left an indelible mark. Our group, led by a younger professor named George, found ourselves lost in the Rodney Mountains National Park. Navigational challenges weren't cause for panic, instead, they added an element of excitement to the journey. We aimed to cross a particular mountain, relying on finding a specific pass. Armed with maps and minimal supplies due to a strategy of obtaining food from villages along the way, we missed one stop and soon faced a shortage. As our food dwindled, George and another member scouted for potential sources. Returning with news of a village not marked on our maps, 
we decided to approach and purchase supplies, regardless of the cost. Starving and desperate, we trudged toward the village, which appeared welcoming at first glance. However, our initial relief turned to unease as we sensed an undercurrent of hostility from some villagers. Despite their hospitality in offering goat milk, goat meat, and baked potatoes, an unspoken tension lingered. When we requested assistance in finding the mountain pass, the village headman cryptically refused, insisting on waiting until morning. Unwilling to stay overnight due to uncomfortable encounters with some village boys, we pressed on in the twilight, fearing encounters with the wildlife. Our suspicions about the village heightened when we discovered, upon reaching the other side, that there were no traces of it on our maps. Perplexed, we sought information from a local bar owner. To our astonishment, the bar owner claimed that no villages existed around the mountain pass and that they had been demolished during the communist era. He dismissed our account, asserting that the villagers had been relocated to collective farms for their supposed benefit. The conversation took a dark turn when he accused them of cannibalism, claiming they consumed the weakest among them to conserve resources. This revelation shocked us, especially considering we had consumed food and milk provided by the villagers. Despite our skepticism, the bar owner's horror at our unwitting consumption left an eerie impression. Questions swirled about the authenticity of the claim and the motivations behind such a gruesome accusation. The unsettling nature of our experiences continued when, in the middle of the night, we were awakened by a group of mysterious individuals shining flashlights down on our campsite. Faced with an unnerving standoff, we managed to scare them off with a show of numbers. The following morning, we hurriedly crossed the mountain pass, grateful to leave the mysterious village and its nocturnal visitors behind. Reflecting on these two unsettling tales, I've come to understand the fragility of our sense of security, even in the midst of nature's beauty. Whether stumbling upon a crime scene or encountering mysterious villagers with dubious claims, these experiences have left an indelible mark on my psyche, urging me to approach the unknown with caution and a healthy dose of skepticism. I grew up in New England, immersed in a world of privilege that defied the old stereotypes. While most girls yearned for ponies, I actually received one for my twelfth birthday, a Cremello Welsh pony named Custard. It was love at first sight. During the summer of 1997, I rode Custard almost every day, exploring the vast land my family owned just outside Norwalk, Connecticut. Weekends were reserved for more extensive rides with my mom, an experienced rider who knew the best trails in Fairfield County. My dream crystallized into a tangible passion as I learned the intricacies of caring for custard. The vision of a life intertwined with horses and ponies fueled my aspirations. It was a dream job that I believed would bring fulfillment until retirement. But one fateful day, that dream was brutally ripped away from me, altering the course of my life forever. Mom, always riding ahead on her prized and illusion, insisted that I could lead only when I had proper control of Custard. Finally, after persistent requests, she nodded with a smile. The excitement surged within me, I yearned to feel the freedom of cantering through the woods, just Custard and me, as if we could ride all the way to Mexico like the cowboys in the movies. On that particular day, I might have ridden a little too far ahead. Slowing Custard to a stop, I realized mom wasn't behind me. Instead of turning back to meet her, I reveled in the solitude of the woods, savoring the tranquility of that unseasonably balmy fall afternoon. It should have been my first warning, the absence of bird songs, the eerie stillness. Oblivious, I continued trotting along the trail, captivated by the quietude. Just as I was about to call out for mom, my world shattered in half a second. I had often gazed down at Custard's neck, enamored by his ears twitching and tensing to distant sounds, his blond mane glowing in the sunlight. That day, my eyes were fixed where they shouldn't have been when his head disintegrated before me. 
The deafening bang in the near distance barely registered as Custard collapsed, trapping my left leg beneath him. The pain was excruciating, and I was held in place, forced to witness the aftermath. The bullet, intended for a deer, had claimed Custard's life. The hunters, lost in the woods, had mistaken him for game. Mom, arriving in terror at the sounds of my screams, ensured the hunters faced legal consequences. They were arrested, sued for damages, and had their licenses revoked for life. Mom insisted it was no accident, a belief she carried to her last day. I shared her conviction, convinced the hunters, whether dumb or malicious, knew what they were doing. Though they faced legal repercussions, the laws treated animals as property. Taking a life, even one that belonged to someone, was akin to breaking a car window. I underwent extensive therapy to step outside again, haunted by Custard's death. Even after 25 years, the memories lingered, the trigger to my aversion to horses and, unexpectedly, to most meats. The trauma reshaped my relationship with food. Meat, reminiscent of that gruesome scene, became a constant reminder of Custard's demise. The mere sight of it triggered distress, except for seafood. Seafood, with its vast difference from mammalian flesh, became a tolerable exception. Tuna steak remained an exception, a lingering association with the past that I couldn't overcome. Custard's memory persisted, an indelible mark on my life. I dwelled on his blonde mane, the way his ears twitched, and the freedom we once shared in those woods. The hunters, however, had gotten away with their lost-in-the-woods excuse. It fueled a simmering anger within me, anger at a legal system that failed to deliver the justice I believed they deserved. I often contemplated the hunters, wondering if they were truly lost or if their actions were driven by malice. Mom's conviction never wavered, and I found solace in the fact that they lost their hunting privileges for life. However, the absence of prison sentences gnawed at me. Taking a life, even if accidental, deserved more than a revocation of privileges. The laws, treating animals as mere property, felt inadequate. The pain I endured, both physical and emotional, transcended the legal definition of property damage. Custard was more than property, he was a companion, a friend, a part of my dreams. The legal system's limitations frustrated me, accentuating the helplessness I felt in the face of such a profound loss. Despite the therapy and passage of time, the scars of that traumatic day persisted. Horses, once a source of joy, became triggers for anxiety. The dream of working with them or ponies, once so vivid, dissipated in the wake of Custard's tragic end. The outdoors, once a sanctuary, remained tinged with fear. Custard's memory and the injustice of his death shaped my worldview. The hunters, oblivious or malicious, became symbols of a flawed system that failed to provide the closure I sought. The pain of that day, the loss of a dream, and the impotence in the face of injustice lingered, a complex tapestry woven into the fabric of my life.